is titled Catholics and the Sexual Revolution, and it's by Dr. Andrew Fung. Dr. Andrew Fung graduated from the University of Tasmania with a medical degree in 1985, and he began work as a GP in Sydney in 1990 and practices to this day as a GP. He has a special interest in promoting and defending the teachings of Humanae Vitae. Andrew is a Catholic apologist and a former catechist, and has also uh, been was a past coordinator of the communications course at the Sydney Archdiocesan Seminary, and is also a teacher of the theology of the body at the Catholic Adult Education Centre at Lickham. Andrew is married to Marion, uh, who's a high school teacher, and he has three uh, lovely children. And I'd just like to. Uh, Welcome Andrew to the podium and for his wonderful talk, Catholics and the Sexual Revolution. Ladies and gentlemen, perhaps we could start in the usual way with a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Come, O Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and kindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created. Thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of the Holy Spirit, by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that in the same spirit we may be always truly wise, and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We'll just invoke some saints. I'm very blessed. My wife brought up our little relic of St. Jared Magella. And so we're in the St. Jared Magella room. So we'll invoke his aid and a few of the saints of the day. St. Jared Magella. St. John Chrysostom. St. Timothy and Titus. St. Angela Marici. Blessed John Paul II. Um, we will just have questions if there's time at the end. So if you allow me to give the talk. Ladies and gentlemen, reverend fathers and sisters, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? Our world is in such a moral mess. And we only have to look at Australia to see how bad things really are. Our divorce rate is about 40%, four in 10 marriages. 30 to 40% of children in Australia are now born out of wedlock, 30 to 40%. Multiple sexual partners are very common today with rampant sexually transmitted diseases. In Australia, the average number of sexual partners was reported as more than 13 in 2005. And even in Catholic Poland, it was reported as almost six partners. So we have a big problem. We have couples who usually live together before marriage, even our parliamentary head, is living in an irregular situation. So-called Catholics vote for embryonic experimentation and adoption by same-sex couples. And of course, people justify this barbaric practice of abortion, which really is a new holocaust, a new genocide. It's out of control with something like 80,000 abortions in Australia per year and more than a million in the United States. There's just some examples. What do you think, then, is the main driver of the sexual revolution? Of course, we know, ultimately, it is Satan, the devil. But what is the human means that he uses to drive this revolu revol revolution? Well, I believe it is contraception. Yes. Why is it contraception? <laughs> it's because contraception stops couples getting pregnant. It's very simple and enables sex before marriage, promiscuity, adultery, de facto relationships and of course abortion is the backup to failed contraception. But would you believe that Catholics are largely responsible for the sexual revolution? Why is that? Because two Catholics stand behind the development of the oral contraceptive pill. Margaret Sanger and Dr. John Rock. Margaret Sanger, lapsed Catholic, who began family planning clinics in search for the metric contraceptive pill. And Dr. John Rock, 
daily mass-going Catholic. Catholic doctor, obstetrician, gynecologist who conducted the clinical trials and who tried to get the church to change her teaching against artificial contraception. Unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, there is a third Catholic element to the sexual revolution. And Monsignor touched upon it in the talk this morning. And that is the bishops and priests of the 60s and 70s who failed to defend Pope Paul VI and his 1968 encyclical Humani Vitae, which as we know said it is still a sin to contracept. And with what result in the Catholic Church today? Most Catholic couples disobey the Church's teaching and take contraceptives like the pill. And most Catholics today a really Catholic version of Protestants, with all due respect to Reverend Fred Nile here. <laughs> and don't even go to Mass regularly on Sundays. Some, of course, Protestants outdo us Catholics, of course, as we know. So the title of this talk is Catholics and the Sexual Revolution. And I'm going to, going to talk about three things. We're going to look at those two major Catholic players behind the development of the pill, Margaret Sanger and Dr John Rock. We're going to look at Humane Vitae and its response. And thirdly, if there's time, we're going to discuss the Catholic counter-sexual revolution for rebuilding the culture of life and love. Firstly, the development of the pill. Margaret Sanger and Dr. John Rock, you could say, were the two anti-apostles of the sexual revolution. We'll start with Margaret. She was born in the, 19, in the 1880s and was a baptised, confirmed Catholic. And unfortunately, she's a prime example of the dictum, the corruption of the best is the worst. Her faith collapsed under the cynical influence of her father, an atheist, free-thinking socialist, a so-called free-thinker. And she herself became exactly like him, even worse. Socialist, atheist, free-thinker, and associated with all the radical left-wing liberals of the time. It is said that her father, she blamed her father for the mother's untimely early death at 50. And she was quoted as saying over her mother's coffin to her father, you caused this. Mother is dead from having too many children. She became a nurse and then experienced the major formative influence in her life. She attended a woman after her second self-induced abortion in which this poor woman passed away. And so she became convinced of the need to discover the magic pill, the perfect contraceptive. In 1914, she launched a newspaper called The Woman Rebel to promote, to promote her ideas, contraception, and so on. And its slogan was, No Gods and No Masters. Are reminiscent of Lucifer's cry, I will not serve, non servium. And it was almost like 1914, there was an outbreak of World War I. It was like in 1914, she declared war on the family with a magazine. Now, Sanger was obsessed with sex and promoted sex outside of marriage, adultery, and even teenage sexual activity. She wanted to free sexual expression from traditional morality and use it for selfish sexual fulfillment and spiritual illumination. Of course, it's very well known that she was promiscuous and even when married for the second time, had a prenuptial agreement that allowed her to do whatever she wanted. Of course, she opposed the Catholic Church, saying, the Catholic Church's view on contraception 
enforces subjugation by turning women into a mere incubator. Terrible language. She believed in so-called safe abortions. And she once said, the most merciful thing that a large family does to one of its infant members is to kill it. Unbelievable. Sanger herself was the one who toy coined the term birth control. But she had other radical ideas, racial purification through awarding sterilization, eugenics, more children from the fit and less from the unfit. And we've just heard from Monsignor about the genetic testing for in vitro fertilization embryos tested and then if they're not fit then disposed of. She believed in global overpopulation. This is going way back in the early 20th century. For the fire and zeal that would rival St Paul, she embarked on a one-woman crusade to change anti-contraceptive laws in America and spread the gospel of birth control. As her son Grant put it, mother was seldom around. She just left us with anybody handy and ran off. We didn't know where. In fact, you could say she was like the archetypal radical feminist of today who sacrifices even her own children for personal goals. So common today. I just had a patient who I see and she's a singer. And she refuses to have any more than one child so that she can further her singing career. Just following in the footsteps of Margaret Sanger. Now, so successful was Sanger that in 1930, the Anglican Church finally allowed contraception at the Lambeth Conference. And of course, unfortunately, other Christian churches followed. Finally, in the late 60s, in 1951, she met a scientist George Pincus, who agreed to help find the hormonal contraceptive. And Pincus joined with one Dr. John Rock, our daily mass going Catholic, who organized the clinical trials on poor third world women, in which two died in the process. It's very interesting that Rock always believed the advice of his hometown priest. John Always stick to your conscience. Never let anyone else keep it for you, and I mean anyone else. Conscience which would become the catch cry of those who rejected the Pope's teaching in Humani Vida years later. Isn't that true? He ignored the Catholic Church's teaching banning contraception when he signed a petition to change the law, anti-contraceptive laws in America in Massachusetts in 1931. Now, Rock believed in birth control, not for entirely bad reasons, because he had seen so many women suffer poor health after multiple pregnancies. He believed birth control could prevent, pre could prevent poverty, but he also believed in global overpopulation and the need for world population control. Finally, in 1959, the pill was released for menstrual problems and of course that was merely the code word, the medical code for contraception. Brock himself believed the pill should only be for married couples but of course that would be swept away by Sanger's sexual revolution. But Rock knew what he wanted. He wanted the Catholic Church to change its teaching to allow the pill and at age 70 launched an, a one-man campaign to gain Vatican approval. He, like Sanger, went on the road to lecture and spread his message and gain support for changing the moral law. In 1963, he published The Time Has Come, a Catholic doctor's proposals to end the battle over birth control. The debates sparked by Rock's book received wide publicity and it was featured in Time magazine on the cover of Newsweek and a one-hour NBC television program. As Rock became a familiar figure in America and abroad, his view quickly took root among the laity, as well as among many Catholics.
Catholic religious leaders. Eventually, the church took notice and Pope Paul VI had before him the reports of the Population Commission, Population and Birth Control Commission, the so-called Birth Control Commission, which he had to consider before he gave his verdict, as we know in that encyclical letter, Humana Vitae. The majority report wanted change. The minority report, which included the future of Pope John Paul II, Cardinal Wojtyla, argued for no change. And incidentally, some of you may know that St. Padre Pio actually personally wrote to Pope Paul VI a few months before he died, before the release of the letter, Humanae Vitae, urging him not to change the Church's teaching. Perhaps it was he was like St. Francis of Assisi, St. Catherine of Siena, carrying the church on his back at the time in that critical moment of history, Catholic history. Now we're going to turn to part two. We finished part one, the development of the pill through Sanger and Rock, and now we're going to look at Humana Vitae and its response. And I'm going to take a number of points from Humana Vitae and comment on them and look at the response that it got. As we know, in 1968, Pope Paul VI released Humanae Vitae, looking specifically at the issue of artificial contraception. Of course, he couldn't change the Church's teaching. What was wrong yesterday cannot be right today. What was not true before cannot be true now. What was always a mortal sin cannot suddenly become a virtuous act. Obviously, the infallibility of the Church was at stake. So in Humana Vitae, the Pope said, each and every act must remain open to the transmission of life. But it's interesting, the majority report argued that a couple could be in general open to life, but not specifically every single act. But this is faulty logic. Now, the married ladies here, supposing your husband came up with this bright idea, I will be in general faithful to you, but not every act of marital union has to be with you. <laughs> what would you say to him, courtesy of Christopher West analogy? What would you say to him? Get lost. Right, that's wrong. Just a, each and every act must be with your spouse. So each marital act must be open or ordered to the transmission of life. So Pope Paul expressly excluded direct sterilization, whether perpetual or temporary, whether of the man or the woman, and every action to render procreation impossible. So that meant all artificial contraceptives were declared immoral, the pill, IUDs, morning after pill, condoms, diaphragms, the lot. He said, it's not allowed, it's not licit, even for the gravest reasons, to do evil that good may follow. Good, good ends do not just justify evil means. A good end, avoiding having a child for serious reasons, does not justify an evil means by contraception. Now, we all know that eating is pleasurable, okay? But overeating leads to obesity. If you wanted to lose weight, you could either eat less and exercise more, or you could do as the ancient Romans, eat more and just vomit it up. <laughs> well, that's wrong, isn't it? Yes. Well, just as this is wrong to eat purely for pleasure and vomit up food to avoid weight gain, so it's wrong to contracept when you want to avoid a pregnancy for just reasons, just to have the pleasure of the marital act. But just as it's okay to fast and periodically abstain from food to lose weight, so it's okay to abstain during the fertile part of the woman's cycle to avoid a child for serious reasons and continue conjugal relations during infertile time. And so this is what Pope Paul VI says. Serious reasons could justify spacing out births, avoiding falling pregnant for a while, even an indeterminate period of time. I have the knowledge of a couple the father, the husband's now dead, and I knew the son, 
that his mother had a, a serious heart condition and she went into heart failure during the labour. And so she was told she couldn't have any more children that would threaten her own life. And so she used natural family planning, those days was the rhythm method, for the whole of her married life after the birth of her single child. So serious reasons could justify spacing out births, even for an indeterminate period, as that woman did. But only, as we said, by abstaining when a woman could fall pregnant and using the infertile time of the cycle to manifest affection and safeguard mutual fidelity. Now some people might argue, well look, what's the difference between one couple abstaining during the fertile time to avoid conception and say another couple using the pill? After all, the result is the same, isn't it? There's no baby. Well, apart from the abortive fasting effects of the pill, we have not time to discuss, in the first case, natural family planning, there is a legitimate use of a natural disposition, abstaining during the fertile time and using the, inf the, the infertile time, abstaining during the fertile time using the infertile time, and which God has provided as a natural disposition. But in the second case, using contraceptive, I'm impeding the developing natural processes. I'm interfering with nature, with the very act itself. I'm actively sterilizing the inherently procreative act. Abstaining, there's no interference in the act at all. We're not doing anything. We're not doing it now. We're abstaining. The goal is the same, but the means are different. It's the difference between my father who died naturally of cancer or giving him a lethal injection to kill him. In both cases, my father dies. But the first case is a natural death. I abstain from doing anything. The second case, it's murder. By the way, some people often argue, well, natural family planning is not very effective at all, is it? Well, that's not true. That's not true. Perhaps there are billions of relation that the teachers here in the audience. The statistics show that natural family planning is extremely effective, comparable to the pill in preventing a pregnancy where desired. Another point you might have mentioned is that there are two inbuilt meanings in the marital act. The two meanings of the marital act, unity and procreative, these are inseparable. They are inseparably connected. You can ask yourself, well, how is this so? Today, the separation occurs very, very often. It's because the marital act involves the gift of a man's seed given to his wife. So whenever there is union, there is procreated meaning, because at the same time the seed is given, it's always a potentially appropriate act. It's always potentially correct, because that's the nature of that gift, the seed. Now I want to mention about five points that Pope Paul VI made, which were very timely and, in a sense, prophetic. Firstly, true love would be preserved by keeping the unity and procreative meanings together in the marital act. True love would be preserved. As he said, the sense of true mutual love in its fullness is preserved by safeguarding the unity and procreative meanings of the marital act. Well, let's look at the statistics. Those who practice contraception have a divorce rate of in excess of 30%. As the states in Australia just a few years ago, there were 160,000 marriages and 47,000 divorces, about 40%. But does anybody know the divorce rate among those who use after family planning? 1%? The undertakers? Point two percent. Two per thousand. A prophetic Pope Paul VI. Number two. He could see a wide and easy road to conjugal infidelity and a general lowering of morality, especially for men and the young contraception. How true is that today? 
divorce, sex premarital affairs, living together before marriage, sex before marriage, abortion, so you can just go on. It's all there. Some people say those contraceptives prevent abortions. Very common to hear abortion clinics. I think mean, clinics espousing this one. But that's ridiculous because abortion is the backup to failed contraception. It's like throwing fuel on the fire, as Crystal always said. You might be interested to know that the community failure rate, or the practical failure rate of the pill, is about 6% per year. 3% for married couples and about 12% for those who are not. That means in five years on the pill, one third of those women, one third will have the dilemma of an unintended pregnancy. One third in five years. How many times have I been asked as a doctor for an abortion referral, which of course is declined, after failed contraception? The pill leads to abortion. The pill leads to abortion. Can anyone see the connection between contraception and same-sex unions? The results are same, isn't it? A sterile union. A third prophetic point, men will lose respect for women. Without the possibility of pregnancy, women will become sexually available to men seven days a week. An obvious temptation to selfish sexual expression. Paraphrase put Paul the sixth, how easy it will be for men to fail and see the woman as their beloved companion to love, cherish, <coughs> and respect. He will lose sight of her as a person and see her more as a sex object. The numbing effect of habit will tend to make her into an instrument of pleasure, a thing to be used for self gratification. Pornography, lap dancing, men's clubs, prostitution. Monos and beachwear that women have little choice but to buy and wear that expose so much of their body that is related to the marital act. What about the degrading sexual practices that many women endure to make their men happy or to hold on to relationships? Cardinal Wojtyla, before he was Pope, wrote that famous book, Love and Responsibility. And he said, Using someone, it's the very opposite of love. The very opposite of love. I can use things, but I must never use persons. And we know this, it's written in the heart. We never like to be used by another person. This is just a bad feeling. The only proper attitude towards another person is love rightly understood. And this is what he called the personalistic norm. The abuse of power, point number four. In the hands of public authorities, contraception would become a dangerous weapon. Classical example, China and the one-child policy, which has just recently been changed. As a result of the one-child policy, there is a demographic imbalance between males and females. There's 50 million more men than women in China more than double the population of Australia. And when I went back to China a number of years ago, it was confirmed to me all the practices you've heard probably Steve Mosher talk about. The fact that women are monitored to take their contraceptives, their periods are monitored, and if they fall pregnant, then they're forced to have abortions. Well, there are huge financial sanctions. And I had a friend who studied Australia, he was from China, and his sister was born, and his parents had to pay a lot of money to have her. The United States. Do you know that aid to poor countries is often conditional to the acceptance of contraceptives to birth control? Isn't that true? <laughs> Why is this? The world's richest country doing it to poor countries. Because some people in the United States see big overseas populations as a threat to national security. Even in Australia, we have people 
clamoring for sanctions against large families. In Australia, sex education is compulsory mandated by the state, even in Catholic schools. Thanks to Margaret Sanger and International Council of and the Clinics. We even have it now in primary school, sex education. Fifth and final prophetic point, which I've seen you touched on, unlimited dominion. Pope Paul the sixth said, man does not have unlimited dominion over his body in general. So also with particular reason, he has no such dominion over his generative, his progressive powers as such. No man may literally surpass them even, surpass his limits. Margaret. Margaret said, Margaret Sanger said that each woman is the absolute mistress of her own body. It's my body, I'll do what I like with it. Isn't the slogan we hear today? Yeah. What does it lead to? Unlimited personal autonomy. I can make babies without making love. Test tube babies. I can bear other couples' babies. Surrogacy. I can abort my baby. I can decide life and death for my baby. I can decide life and death for others. Euthanasia. I can decide life and death for myself. It's suicide. All these things just follow on. The slippery slope, as it's been called, is very, very true and uh, very clear in Australia. So, what happened after Humane Vita was released? So now we're talking about the aftermath. In perhaps one of the biggest understatements of history, Pope Paul VI said in Humana Vitae, it can be foreseen that this teaching will perhaps not be easily received by all. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> to tell the truth, the Church is not surprised to be made like her divine founder, a sign of contradiction. He felt the pressure to change with a majority report, and he predicted a negative response. And unbelievably, the very day the document was released in Rome, he was undermined by none other than the Pope's spokesman, who signed the majority report which wanted contraception. Unbelievable. And he said that Humano Vitae was not infallible. Was what did people think? If it's not infallible, we can ignore it. That's right. And that's exactly what happened. Himano Vita was greeted with an explosion of dissent among the bishops, even the most prominent theologians of the time. Six hundred, more than six hundred theologians publicly signed their dissent, headed by Dr. Charles Curran including Bernard Perry, who was on the commission itself. Of course, he sided with the majority report. And, unfortunately, there was also another senator, Dr. William May. But, as you may well know, he recanted, he changed his mind, and he said, if contraception is justifiable, then perhaps artificial insemination, test tube reproduction are morally justifiable too. Moral theology invented to justify contraception could be used to justify any kind of deed. And how true is that today? Any immoral deed is justified. And sure enough, Charles Curran, who eventually lost his post as a Catholic teacher, eventually disagreed with the Pope's official teaching on abortion and sexuality and divorce. This follows. Bishops' conferences and catechisms around the world reassured the faithful they could still contracept and receive Holy Communion. They failed to tell the faithful they were not allowed to contracept. A few years ago, Cardinal Schomburg, the head of the church in Austria, under the Pope, of course, said that many bishops' conferences around the world, including those of Belgium, Canada, France, Germany, the Netherlands, the United States, 
and later, the, and later Australia assured the faithful that contraception was a matter of conscience. Compared to the Australian bishops, there was a very, very small retraction that the horse had bolted and the damage had been done. By, 19, by the 1980s, almost 80% of American Catholic women used contraceptives. 80%. 29% of American priests think that's okay. 15% of confessors, only 15% of confessors ask penitents to follow the church's teaching. 15%. And there's no reason to suggest Australia was any different. But what is conscience? Conscience is my mind applying the moral law, what is right and wrong, to particular actions. And of course the moral law is taught without error by the church. The church says contraception is wrong, my conscience asks is taking the pill the purpose of contraception? Contraceptive? Of course it is. Therefore my conscience judges rightly that taking the contraceptive pill is wrong. Now, we have to be honest, it is true we have to follow our conscience. But people thought that conscience means making up right and wrong. And that's crazy. I can no more decide that contraception is right than I could decide that murder is right and set off a suicide bomb today, right in front of you. Yeah? People aren't stupid, are they? They're not stupid. If you can decide to contracept and still be a good Catholic, you can decide anything and still be a good Catholic. You can dissent from any church teaching and still claim Catholic. And so we have now so-called gay Catholic politicians vote for their conscience to allow gay couples to adopt children, embryonic experimentation, IVF, and so on. The Catholic, the conscience Catholic is a dissenter and really a Protestant, in respects to our on the guest here, a cafeteria Catholic. Why not decide on conscience whether to go to Mass on Sunday? In the 50s, 60 to 65% of Catholics attended Mass. 1996 it was 28%. This is in Australia. 2001 it was 13.3%. 2010, 2012, 10% perhaps. Although it's a little bit better in the Sydney Archdiocese, so we're short by our cardinal. Today the dissent in the church is largely institutionalised in seminary programs. It's in private advice versus the public stance of church by dissenting so-called Catholic institutions, by Catalyst Renewal, Catholics of Choice, Court Election, and dissenting Catholic religious orders, which subversively, subversively teach methods of contraception in our Catholic schools, destroying the faith of innocent Catholic children. And I just, on the weekend, spoke to the husband of a woman who was told how to use contraceptives in the Catholic school that she went to. How to use a condom. The last thing I'm going to consider is the fall in the birth rate. Now sees Humana Vita as prophetic. He's changed his mind. Forty years ago, the Vatican had warned the pill would lead to a dramatic fall of the birth rate in the West. And now we know Europe is dying, committing demographic suicide, with the birth rate below replacement in virtually all the Western countries, if at all. Why, Cardinal Bork Schulman says, part of the reason is the lack of commitment by the bishops to the church's true, fruitful, loving, and beautiful pro-life teaching. And I quote him, I think that it is also our sin as bishops, even if none of us were bishops in 1968. Bishops have not had, nor did not have, the courage to swim against the tide and say yes to humano vitae. And third Catholic element. Now some of you may be remember wondering what happened to Margaret Sanger and John Rock. <laughs> Left a bit hanging. Well, Margaret died in her 80s, and she appeared to die quite unrepentant. Even as a grandmother, she advised immoral sexual activity to her granddaughter, I won't be specific. And she claimed her sole aim in life was to help women. 
and what a legacy she's left. With broken hearts and relationships, now broken bodies. As 50 years on, we know that the pills, cancerous and other deadly side effects are becoming more clearly documented. To find herself, she, apparently she died a bisexual demoral, which is a, a perhaps a sedative, and an alcohol addict. A bisexual demoral and alcohol addict. And left behind perhaps the most evil, one of the most evil organisations ever conceived, International Planned Parenthood. What about Dr John Locke? Well, Locke's hometown priest told John Locke to follow his conscience. When Humana Vita was banned, he followed his conscience out of the church and died in his 90s. Bitterly disappointed and from all outward observances, still a lax Catholic. Sarah Davidson interviewed him a year before his death and asked him whether he still believed in an afterlife. Of course I don't. Heaven and hell, Rome and all that church stuff, that's for the solace for the multitude. I was an ardent practicing Catholic for a long time and I really believed it all then, you see. Tragedy of Dr. John Rock. Fortunately, we've had another a Dr. John, Dr. John Billings, who would one day introduce one of the most simplest and effective means of natural birth control family plan, I should say, Billings ovulation method. <coughs> now, the final part of my talk is to discuss the Catholic sexual counter-revolution, rebuilding the culture of life and love. What are we going to do now? The world's in a mess. How do we respond to the falling birth rates? How do we build a culture of life? Well, I believe we need to hear Our Lady's message at Fatima, a call for prayer, penance, and reparation, especially through the Rosary and Eucharistic Adoration. Prayer. We need to pray for good, holy, fruitful marriages. We need to pray for holy vocations, priesthood, and religious life. We need to pray to deeply understand God's wonderful plan of life, love, sex, and marriage. We need to pray for our bishops and priests that they may courageously proclaim and teach this plan and challenge Catholics to stop contraception and use natural family planning if they have to. We can pray outside of abortion clinics with the helpers. We need to pray for the conversion of souls caught up in a sexual mire, as Monsignor outlined above. Penance and reparation. Uh, Penance and reparation. Let's be honest. We all, especially we men, are wounded by original sin and are affected by lust. We've all committed sins of impurity of one form or another. And Pope Paul VI said, The honest practice of birth regulation demands that husband and wife tend towards securing perfect self-mastery. At John Paul II, later on saying his so-called theology of the body, man is precisely a person because he is master of himself and his self-control. Indeed, insofar as he's master of himself, he can give himself to the other. He's really saying you cannot really give yourself unless you can control yourself. Periodically abstaining, periodic continence, that means Containing yourself, periodic continence, containing yourself, controlling yourself to give yourself to others. If you cannot say no, your yes means nothing. If you cannot say no to sex, then you cannot say yes to real love. How am I going to get this sexual self-control? How am I going to abstain? How is it possible? Through the means the church has always given. The sacramental grace is a regular confession. Holy Communion, daily if possible. Continual effort. This is the cross in marriage. Say no to self. Say no to food. If I can say no to food, I can say no to lust. Food control leads to sexual self-control. We can fast to make up for our sins of lust. I mentioned periodic abstinence. Married couples knows, know, they know the power of abstaining helps to freshen up the marital act. It's a little bit like abstaining from chocolates and cakes during Lent, and how good it is to have them 
after they serve on Easter Sunday. Pope Paul VI said it will help drive out selfishness, the enemy of true love. Periodic absence leads to the development of personalities through spiritual enrichment, gives peace and serenity to families, favours solutions to others' problems, attention to one's spouse. We need to do reparation for the sins of impurity in our world. This is rampant magazines, TV, radio, movies, and so on. The sins of Sanger and Rock. The sins of our Catholic leaders who failed to defend the Pope and Humane Vitae. For our current dissenters. We also need to study and form ourselves the churches, of the Church's beautiful teaching on life, love, sex, and marriage in Humane Vitae. We study Pope John Paul II's teachings in his Theology of the Body. Because theology of the body is actually a commentary. He called it a commentary on humano vitae. Pope John Paul II developed a deeper personal understanding of why the church teaches that artificial contraception is wrong, beyond just simply breaking the natural law. If we can understand this teaching and live it out, I believe we can renew the face of the earth. I believe if there is one thing Pope John Paul II said that I will think would make the critical difference in the battle against the culture of death, the term he coined is this. Marriage corresponds to the vocation of Christians only when it reflects the love which Christ the bridegroom gives to the church his bride and which the church attempts to return to Christ. Marriage corresponds to the vocation of Christians only when it reflects the love which Christ the bridegroom gives to the church's bride and which the church attempts to return to Christ. If we can strive to live this out in all the ordinary, practical circumstances of married life, and for those who are celibate in their nuptial union with our Lord, we will build a new culture of life and a new civilization of love and defeat the culture of death and the Catholics of the sexual counter-revolution. As Moses said to the people, I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your descendants may live loving the Lord your God obeying his voice and clinging to him. <clears throat> My friends, let us choose life. And the insights into the, the sexual revolution and the forces and the players behind that. That may have stirred in some people questions that we really have about a 10 minute opportunity to ask those questions. Yes. Okay, so um, we have a roving mic with Michael there, and we have about 10 minutes, so uh, just a few brief questions. Over there, this is just a yes and no, or no. So was humane vitae infallible? Well, is it? it? If infallible, humane vitae is infallible. Pope John Paul II has confirmed that it's basically virtually said it without saying it. It's a continual teaching of the church, what is taught everywhere and at all times for the church really is infallible by the church. Um, I've had a few women say to me in the past that they take the contraceptive pill for some other serious health problems they have. Um, can you as a doctor mention some of these other health problems and is the pill seriously the only medication out there to help with those problems? The question is, uh, women have been taking the pill for medical reasons, and is that okay by the church, and are there other alternatives? Whereas Pope Paul VI clearly said that taking contraceptives, even though they have a contraceptive effect, for medical reasons can be justified. I personally think the justification must be a very, very serious one, and some theologians suggest that the couple should abstain while a woman is taking the medication if they're in a relationship, marital relationship, to avoid the problem of 
the bought, you bought a fashion effect of the pill. And yes, there are other alternatives. The pill is basically the drug which shuts down a woman's fertility. So it's a very sledgehammer or steamrolling medication as, as an answer of medicine. It's not, very, it's not actually curing the disease. It's suppressing the problem that will generally resurface once you stop the pill. But there are medical uses because sometimes there's not, no, no great alternatives. Having said that, there are alternatives that one can look into, natural things, but it does take a lot of, sometimes a lot of research, a lot of looking and seeking and finding. But in the general, if you want to be off the pill and side effects, having the risk of its side effects, then I think it's better to try that route, maybe acupuncture, maybe natural herbal means and so on, consult a good naturopath. The, the medical means I, I'm not really happy with in general myself. Thank you for that question. Um, abstinence. Uh, between married couples, uh, periodic abstinence uh, as a, a recommended way to, I suppose, um, enliven the love between them or help the love between them, even if there isn't a, a need for um, for natural family planning or, or things like that, just as a reaper thing anyway. Was that sort of something you were suggesting there or were you only suggesting it in the context of natural family planning? Was I suggesting that Couples should periodically abstain in order to um, assist with the, 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 love, the marital union of the couple. I think most couples realise, unless they have gone into menopause, there is a certain type of month where they have to abstain. It's called the menstrual period. So periodic abstaining is a natural part of marital life anyway. Whether couples should go on to abstain for other reasons, that's purely up to the couple itself. If support gives a recommendation that abstinence should only be for the purposes of prayer um, and not to tempt each other by staying apart too long. Sounds like good advice to me. But yes, in general, married couples have to abstain anyway periodically because of the menstrual cycle. Thank you. Oh, Doctor, how do you deal with the uh, request for sterilisation and contraception in your medical practice? question is how do I deal with the, problem, with the request for sterilisation and contraceptive in my medical practice, I said have to say no. But I generally try and bring up the nasty side effects of the oral contraceptive pill. Um, for instance, there's something like a 25% increased risk of breast cancer by taking the pill. The World Health Organisation has listed the pill as a carcinogenic drug. The pill is what's called a xenoestrogen. It's a bit of an interest area of at the moment, it's uh, a very powerful super estrogen, and there are many other chemicals in our environment, parabens and so on, which actually affect a woman's fertility and cycle. And a lot of the epi epidemics of women's diseases we're seeing polycystic ovaries, endometriosis, and so on may well be, in fact, not simply due to taking the pill, but due to the environmental xenoestrogen load that's out there in, in our community through things like plastics and pesticides and so on. So it's disrupting already um, female fertility. And male fertility, Carl Gerasi, a Austrian chemist, actually invented a progesterone pill, not for the purpose of contraception. What he did, he wasn't interested in using it for contraceptives, but it actually is used now. And he makes a comment that all these pills being now being taken on by, ingested by the women are now being obviously put into the environment as waste, is actually affecting male fertility. He thought that male fertility was actually caused by this. And in fact, the, the reference ranges for male fertility have been halved to what they were 50 years ago, whatever the time is years ago, because male fertility has dropped down so much and we don't have an official cause, but perhaps it is because of all these environmental estrogens that are running around. One classic case is, I think it's in the United States, where there was a sewage pan plant in a river, and downstream there were lots of fish, fish breeding grounds, and all the females were fine, but the male fish had hermaphrodite characteristics of a part female, part male. So in other words, all the environmental estrogens that were going into our waste was contaminating the women, was contaminating the male fish, and causing them to have intersex characteristics. So 
So there perhaps is something very important here that we need to look at, the poisoning of our environment by excess xenoestrogens, of which one is the oral contraceptive pill. Do all the contraceptive pills have an abortifacient function? Do all, abort, do all contraceptives have an abortifacient function? No, I don't think they do. If you, the condom doesn't because it simply protects, prevents pregnancy as a, a physical barrier, the, the, uh, the diaphragm as well. But a lot of the others do. There was a study done many years ago, I think it was among Swedish women, who were taking the pill and they ultrasounded the woman's ovary every second day and they could see a follicle developing in about 15% of women. In other words, they seem to be ovulating. So sometimes the pill doesn't actually prevent ovulation at all. And the reason this happened is because in the early days, the pill doses are a lot higher and there are a lot more obvious serious side effects like blood clots and sudden death from blood clots in the lung. So they had to drop the dose of the pill to raise its safety profile. And they found that women were still not falling pregnant by lowering the dose. But as you lower the dose, the power to suppress ovulation decreases, and then the other means to have a contraceptive effect, or really it's a fascinant effect, comes into place, other methods of effectiveness. So, yeah, that's... Not all contraceptives are abortifacient, it depends on the mechanism of action. But yes, the pill is abortifacient, the IUD is abortifacient, the, uh, of course the morning after pill, IU486, it's, it's, its mechanism of action is to disrupt a child in the early stages of pregnancy. So most of the others are, but not all of them. Dr. Fung, following one from those comments about the, um, the medical problems of the pill, uh, I was wondering if you could comment on some of the um, uh, political and regulatory challenges that you have as a doctor in, uh, in saying no to women's requests to, um, to have the pill prescribed. Could I comment on the regulatory problems uh, associated with being a doctor saying when I have refused contraceptives? There was actually a case of a woman who, who sued me, took me to court or or wanted um, to, to challenge me in that area officially through the legal system because I refused to prescribe contraceptives because she felt pregnant. Um, and the, the insurance company refused to defend the case even though there was a good case because in actual fact it was all a scam. She felt pregnant but her boyfriend wanted to take her off to some other doctor but I refused and she, she didn't want to do that even though she had the, obviously she was free to do it, and she was urged by her boyfriend, they broke up, and he went to jail for some reason, and he contacted me through jail, through his, his mother, to say that it was all a scam, that she got some compensation. So even your insurance company won't defend you on this point. As far as I know, um, there was a, it comes to me another case, sorry, that, I refused to give the contraceptive pill and the, the Health Care Complaints Commission received a letter of, of um, a what's the word, grievance, thank you, and they contacted the medical board and we had a bit of correspondence and they asked that I put up a sign outlining my practice. So that seemed to end that issue there. But I think each doctor is free still in this in New South Wales to to refuse contraceptives. The situation in Victoria I think is a little bit different because I think a doctor now by law, it's not, not related to contraceptives, but by, by in relationship to abortion, has to refer for abortion, I believe, or refer to someone else who will refer refer her for abortion under law. Of course that's um, in immoral law, we don't have to follow it. But from a Practical perspective leaves a doctor open to being sued. Our last question here with that. Uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, there is some kind of justification in taking the pill for medical reasons, um, although rarely. Um, in any case, how long does it take before the pill is completely out of a woman's system? The question is how long does it take for the pill to come out of a woman's system? I'm not an expert in this area. 
But the people have been known to fall pregnant fairly quickly after taking the pill for a for a number of years. Because every woman is different, every woman is special as we know, not every woman's fertility is the same. And some women are more sensitive to the effects, the, the sterilizing effects of the contraceptives than, than other women. So it does vary. But at best, it can be just a few months, maybe even a month. Some women can conceive straight after stopping the pill. But for other unfortunate women, just taking the pill for a few months is enough to tip her low fertility into infertility, and that may even be permanent from a natural point of view. Obviously, the message is don't take it. Ladies and gentlemen.